All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of the Underground. We are a free, pluralistic, and transnational university and charity founded in 2017 in the basement of a nightclub in Amsterdam. I am Naum, the health program of I Want to Believe, an investigation into religion, belief systems. Uh, this is a three month uh, practice based uh, program to unravel belief systems in relationship to politics, economics, nation states, and society. I would like to welcome uh, our students today, uh, but also our visiting participants. Uh, and we kindly ask you if you could donate and support the existence of this program and many more to come. Just go to the website and of the university and there's a big button that says donate. So we're gonna do a, a 40 minute talk with our uh, incredible guest and then we'll have 15 to 20 minute Q and A. Uh, if you have any questions during the talk, just please type the question in the chat and at the end I will, I will call you. So today I'm very excited to present Dr. Samantha Rose Hill, um, who is, uh, who well, came to BART in 2015 as a postdoctoral fellow at the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities. Her research and teaching interests include critical theory, the Frankfurt School, aesthetic theory, and the history of political thought. Uh, Samantha is completing a manuscript of Hannah Arendt's poetry, which uh, has been edited and translated already into English, Into the Dark, the poems of Hannah Arendt. She's currently working on a monograph that explores the ethical dimensions, dimensions of melancholia. And also Samantha is currently- You have a very old biography of me. So I'm just gonna, oh, that's from okay. six years ago. <laughs> I'm just gonna stop you. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I already want to read that book of poetry. But, well, yes, so I'll, Samantha... just, I'll just say, I'm the assistant director of the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College, visiting assistant professor, political studies, associate faculty at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. And I pop my head into the University of the Underground now and then uh, very joyfully. Um, I just finished a biography of Hannah Arendt, which will be out this August. And I edited and translated her poems, which will be out um, next spring. So. Thank you very much. I just, I couldn't bear to listen to. <laughs> I know, same happens to me, you know, like, like why someone is telling me about my kindergarten education, you know, like I've done know. many more things, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> all yours it's wonderful uh, uh, all right sound. hi everyone it's such a pleasure to be here with you this morning you're in such wonderful and capable hands i'm jealous of you doing this program um so i'm here today to talk to you a little bit about hana Arendt. i'm going to give you what i call the five minute biographical introduction to who she was her life and then I'm going to talk to you about her essay, Ideology and Terror. I'll give you a little bit of background information on the publication of the essay and then walk you through what Hannah Arendt calls the recipe of ideologies. So does that sound good to everyone? Okay. So Hannah Arendt was born in Linden, Hanover, Germany in 1906. When she was three years old, her family moved to Königsberg, uh, which was the capital of East Prussia at the time because her father was dying from syphilis. He died when she was seven years old and she was raised by her mother, Martha Cohn. Her life was interrupted early on by the onset of the Great War. Her family was forced to relocate to Berlin where she attended school for about a year and then moved back to Königsberg with her mother. From a very early age, Hannah Arendt was what she would call different. She was an outsider, a rebel, a pariah, and later an outlaw. By the time she was 15 years old, she was kicked out of school for leading a protest against one of her teachers. He offended her and she led her fellow classmates in a walkout. Her mother pleaded with the principal to let her stay in school, but the problem was Hannah Arendt didn't really like attending school. 
she preferred to learn on her own. By the time she was 14 years old, she knew Greek, Latin, had read all of Kant, and was well into the work of Carl Jaspers. Gives us all something to feel bad about this afternoon. Um, so she didn't really go to school and she missed a lot of classes. Her mother couldn't get her to stay. So at about 16, she was sent to Berlin to finish her studies so that she could prepare, prepare to take her Abitur exams. The Abitur exams are what you need to take to go to college essentially in Germany. She passed those exams with ease. But while she was there, she started taking classes with a young theologian and philosopher named Romano Guardini. And he took a little bit of a different approach to the study of theology, combining classic philosophical texts alongside language and poetry and literature. And that's where she really started to fall in love with the study of philosophy and theology. And then when she was just about 18 years old, as she was finishing her abitur exams, her friend Ernst Grumach, who she had spent time learning Greek with, sent her a letter. It said, the rumors are true. Thinking has come to life. You must follow. Hannah Arendt made her way to Marburg, Germany to of course study with Martin Heidegger. Heidegger was just beginning to write his great work, Being in Time, when Hannah Arendt arrived, and they fell passionately in love and had an on and off relationship over the course of their lives. He was 35, married with two kids at the time. Uh, it didn't work out so well. She ended up breaking up with him after about a year. She went to study phenomenology with Husserl for a semester before making her way to the University of Heidelberg to write her dissertation on concepts of love in St. Augustine under the direction of Carl Jaspers, just as he was beginning to write his great three volume work, Philosophy. And so what that means for those of you who have never studied philosophy before is that Hannah Arendt got to study with the two German fathers of existentialist philosophy, Martin Heidegger, and Carl Jaspers, just as they were beginning to write their works. Arendt did her dissertation on love in St. Augustine in theology and classics and philosophy at Heidelberg. She published that book at the age of 23. And then she moved to Frankfurt, where she became a journalist while she was starting to work on her Habilitation, which is the second book you need to acquire a teaching position in Europe. She was going to write it on a critique of German romanticism, focusing on the letters of Rahel Varnhagen, who had been a friend and kind of student of Goethe. And in 1929, she met and married her first husband. They moved to Frankfurt. She took classes while he was working on his Habilitation there with Ralph Mannheim and Paul Tillich at the Institute for Social Research. But unfortunately, Adorno and Tillich didn't like her husband's work. And after a year, they were forced to leave when he was denied a formal teaching position. They go back to Berlin. And in 1933, after in February 1933, after the burning of the Reichstag, her husband is forced to flee after Bertolt Brecht's address book is confiscated. Arendt stays in Berlin alone. She decides that she has to leave the world of academic philosophy. She has to leave academia. She doesn't want anything to do with that milieu, she says. And she will only from then do political work and only Jewish work. She turns her apartment on Bultholzstrasse into a stop to help communists escape. And after a couple of months of doing research in the Prussian State Library at the request of her friends Hans Blumen, Kurt Blumenfeld, she's arrested by the Gestapo. He had asked her to collect anti-Semitic research statements to be sent to world leaders to let them know how bad things had actually gotten in Germany at the time. After a couple of months of doing this, she was arrested walking out the front door of the Prussian State Library one afternoon, going to meet her mother for lunch. A librarian had reported her asking, what use does an academic have with so many newspapers? She's held by the Gestapo for eight days. She is 
in her own account, essentially released because she was able to flirt her way out of the situation. The young guard had taken a liking to her. And the day after she was released, she fled through Prague, through Switzerland to Paris, where she spent eight and a half years working for a couple of different Zionist organizations, helping Jewish youth escape to then Palestine. In 1935, she went with a group of children to Palestine. She was helping to prepare them to live on kibbutzim on the land. In the spring of 1940, she was forced to report for mass internment and sent to an internment camp in Gers in the south of France. By then she had divorced her first husband, met and married her second husband, Heinrich Blücher, who had been a part of the Spartacus League in Berlin. They were sent to different camps. They didn't know where each other were, where they were. And after about five and a half weeks, she was part of a mass escape with 62 women. They forged exit papers and walked out the front door as the German front was approaching. Not knowing where her husband was, she decided to go to Lourdes to find her friend Walter Benjamin, and then left to Montauban where refugees were gathering. And one afternoon walking down the street, she accidentally bumped into her husband and they were able to reunite. He had made his way there as well, chance. With the help of Varian Fry and some forged exit papers, she was able to escape to the United States in the summer of 1941. She was a stateless person for nearly 20 years. She took a job as a housekeeper outside Boston to learn English. And then she started writing a weekly column in Aufbau, a German speaking weekly for refugees. It was a column calling for the Jewish people to form an international army to fight the Nazis. In 1951, Hannah Arendt published her first major work. The same year she received American citizenship, The Origins of Totalitarianism. And that's where ideology and terror picks up. Origins was published in 1951. Hannah Arendt sent the first outline for the book to her publisher at Houghton Mifflin in 1943. At the time, Hitler was still alive. The war was still going. By the time she finished writing in 1948, Hitler was dead, but Stalin was alive and well. So the book took shape as she wrote over time. In 19... 53, a couple of years after Origins was published, uh, she had been invited to be a visiting professor at Princeton and then Berkeley, and she was working on an essay that was part of a festschrift for her mentor Carl Jasper's 75th birthday. The essay that she published, Ideology and Terror, is incorporated into the Origins of Totalitarianism and included as the fourth chapter of origins in totalitarianism. So it becomes the new end of the book in 1958, and it remains the conclusion to the book. Although the publishing history is interesting and a little bit complicated. But Arendt is writing this essay on ideology and terror after she publishes Origins while she's at work on her next book, The Human Condition. The Human Condition was meant to be a study of Karl Marx. So just for context, she's writing a book on Karl Marx at the height of McCarthyism in America while lecturing at Princeton and Berkeley. And that's the context in which ideology and terror starts to take shape. At the time, she's teaching a course on ideologies and totalitarianism at Berkeley. The course was divided into four sections, which formed the kind of the four sections of the end of the origins of totalitarianism. Pre-totalitarian atmosphere, revolution in one party dictatorship, totalitarian movement, and total domination. The course outlined the decay of political institutions over time, the growth of the masses in modernity, the rise of imperialism, and what happens when political parties become interest group ideologies. So Arendt wanted to 
look at the ways in which political opinions and social discourse are replaced by ideologies over time alongside the collapse of existent political institutions. For her, ideologies are isms, and isms attempt to provide a simple explanation for a complex set of social, economic, and political problems. So when I'm introducing this book, if I'm teaching a class on this book, I always say Origins is this 500 page book. It's written in three sections, which are essentially three books, anti-Semitism, imperialism, and totalitarianism. So as Arendt was working on the book, it changed over time to reflect the new information that was becoming available about Hitler and Stalin as it emerged from Europe. And so when she published it initially in 1951, she ends on reflecting on the note that even if totalitarian regimes disappear from the world, the elements of totalitarianism will continue to exist within society. And she says totalitarian solutions may well survive the fall of totalitarian regimes in the form of strong temptations, which will come up whenever it seems impossible to alleviate political, social, or economic misery in a manner worthy of man. And then when she adds ideology and terror, which is what you read, the whole tenor of the conclusion changes and the elements of totalitarianism, which are numerous, the decline of the nation state, the rise of imperialism and colonialism, the privatization of public institution, the rise of the masses, the relationship between the elite and the mob. She goes through all of these in the text, but when she comes to this new conclusion, she argues that it is loneliness that is the essence of totalitarian government. Loneliness is the common ground of terror. All right, so Arendt is very attentive to language in her writing. So when she uses the word loneliness, she doesn't mean what we probably mean when we say, I feel lonely. She doesn't really offer us an affective account of the feeling of loneliness. What she's doing is trying to understand loneliness as part of the human condition as a political term. So she's going to talk about what she calls organized loneliness. And organized loneliness is a form of political loneliness, which has a relationship to the affective experience of loneliness, but it means something a little bit different. So she's going to draw a set of conceptual distinctions between isolation, loneliness, and solitude in that order. The word that she uses for loneliness is Verlassenheit. It's a German word, and it means literally abandonedness. It's a sense of kind of abandonedness in the world. The word she uses for solitude, which might normally be used for loneliness, is Einsamkeit, which means a kind of oneness with the self. So she's drawing the set of conceptual distinctions to show how the personal experience of loneliness is mobilized by totalitarianism through ideology. And she spends the first part of ideology and terror breaking down what she calls the recipe of ideologies to show how ideology is connected to isolation and loneliness. So she's going to argue that levels of loneliness rise alongside the breakdown of political institutions and social traditions over time. And the consequent feelings of rootlessness and superfluous that follow make people vulnerable to ideology, which offers a simple solution to their miseries. Right? So whereas loneliness was once what she says, a borderline experience suffered in response to certain conditions like old age, she says, loneliness has become an everyday experience of the masses. And totalitarian domination as a new form of government bases itself on the experience of loneliness, on the experience of not belonging to the world at all. So what she's saying there is that when people feel like they're not rooted, when people feel existentially homeless, when they feel rootless in the world, 
when they feel cut off from themselves and others, they are vulnerable to ideology. And so she's going to break that down more. So she wants to work through what each of these are, ideology, isolation, loneliness, and solitude. What is an ideology? For Hannah Arendt, the one sentence definition of ideology is ideologies are isms. Any word that ends with an ism is an ideology. Marxism, feminism, totalitarianism, liberalism, and so weiter, right? Ideologies are isms. Etymologically, an ideology means the logic of an idea. It comes from the French ideologie. It was first used during the French Revolution, but it didn't really take up root in common language until Karl Marx published the German ideology. And then later, Karl Mannheim in 1920, 1928 published Ideology and Utopia, which Hannah Arendt had reviewed for a magazine called Die Gesellschaft in 1929. So ideolo what this means is that ideology originally had a scientific character. It was used to indicate a systematic set of ideas through which the world could be interpreted. So she says, the word seems to imply that an idea can become the subject matter of a science, just as animals are the subject matter of zoology. So the logi of ideology at the end indicates the logic of the thing. So ideologies contain an argument about the movement of history. When one applies an ideology in thinking, the result is not a statement about something that is, but the unfolding of a process which is in constant change. Or to put it another way, ideo ideological thinking injects a secret meaning into every event and experience. And once ideological movements come to power, they change reality in accordance with their ideological claims. So isolation and movement are being used here in two very kind of playful and particular ways. This kind of ideological thinking, lonely thinking, Arendt is going to argue is isolating. So that you don't actively engage in a process of thinking, responding to the world around you as it is, but instead, by subscribing to the ideology, you have stagnant thoughts, which are applied like Procrustean frames that cut off the head and the feet. So let's work through it quickly. There are three constitutive elements of ideology, three elements of ideology that Arendt is going to identify. The first is the scientific character. Ideologies do not explain what is, they explain what becomes. They're concerned with motion, with controlling and predicting the tide of history. Second, ideologies are divorced from experience, which forecloses the possibility of learning anything new. For Arendt, all thinking moves from experience. She's a phenomenal thinker. She's also a kind of materialist. All thinking moves from experience. What ideology does is it divorces thinking from experience. In divorcing thinking from experience, ideology divorces thinking from reality. At the same time, it insists upon a truer reality that is concealed behind the world of perceptible things, things we can touch, taste, smell, experience, and so on, a kind of sixth sense. The third element of ideology is that ideologies do not have the power to transform reality because they do not reflect on what is. So they can only achieve the emancipation of thought from experience by relying on certain logical procedures. Everyone with me? Okay. What are logical procedures? What is the ideology doing? An ideology begins with an accepted axiomatic premise from which everything is deduced and then proceeds with a consistency that only exists within the tide of 
the ideology. So Hannah Arendt's work in many ways is about two questions. Gibt es ein Denken, das nicht tyrannisch ist? Is there a way of thinking that is not tyrannical? And how can we protect spaces of freedom? And freedom for Arendt is synonymous with movement. When she asks the question, is there a way of thinking that is not tyrannical? She follows it with the statement that the point is to resist swimming in the tide at all. What she's describing here in the logical procedure of ideologies is the tide, the forward motion, right? Ideology begins with an accepted axiomatic premise from which everything else is deduced and then proceeds with a consistency that only exists within the ideology. So the only reality that can exist is the reality of the ideology. And since the ideology cannot be affirmed in the realm of actual lived experience, people are forced to retreat further and further inward to affirm the reality that has been created by the ideology, which now guides their thinking process and tells them how to understand the world around them. So an easy example of this that I always, that I always think of um, is Donald Trump's inauguration. Sorry. Uh, if you watched a video of it, perhaps you were there, I don't know, you could see people with umbrellas, you could see the rain, and he said, it is not raining. Okay, now I can feel rain, I can smell rain, hear rain. The statement, it is not raining, does not reflect upon the actual experience, because the point of ideological thinking is not to reflect on actual experience, but to affirm the already existent framework of ideology. So Trump and his followers who agreed that it was not raining, were not actually responding to the experience of rain, but the ideology which claims, of course it would never rain on such an event like this. The more complex example that Arendt gives in her text is racism. And she says that racism is the belief that there is emotion inherent in the very idea of race. And so she spends a lot of time earlier in the book talking about the kind of horrors of Darwinism um, and the logic of raceism as a movement. So the word race in racism doesn't signify any kind of genuine curiosity or interest in a person, but it's the idea by which the movement of history is explained. And so Arendt's point is that ideology tries to make the world calculable and it claims a kind of logical reasoning in doing so. The irony, the irony in this is that the ideology is always irrational because it ignores what is. And instead of trying to confront what is, it tries to explain it away. So Arendt's fundamental point is that ideological thinking turns us away from the world of lived experience. It starves the imagination. It denies plurality and difference. It destroys the space between us that allows us to relate to one another in meaningful ways, the space between us, the interessa, the space that we have to nourish between us to relate. And once ideological thinking has taken up root, experience and reality no longer bear upon thinking. And instead, experience conforms to ideology in thinking. Right? How we experience the world has to conform to the ideology. We don't think from our experiences. And so when Arn is talking about loneliness here, Falassenheit, abandonness, she is not just talking about the affective experience of loneliness. She's talking about a way of thinking. Loneliness arises when thought is divorced from reality, when the common world, the world that we can share and talk about and acknowledge is raining in, has been replaced by the tyranny of coercive logic demands. Um, I'm researching loneliness right now for a book and it's just interesting to note here that historically the way that we've understood loneliness has changed dramatically 
over time. And when it first came into use, loneliness actually referred to doing something, to leaving one's home, to venturing out into the world, to kind of going off on one's lonely, um, to take a trip. But now it's pretty much synonymous with social isolation. And the way that Arendt's talking about it here is in the sense of isolating, right? It stops movement in the world. It also stops movement in thinking actively. So ideology, isolation, and loneliness are different, but at root for Arendt, they refer to a loss of movement in thinking and being. And when one is isolated, when one is lonely in this way, it is easier for thinking to succumb to the tide of ideology, right? It is easier to be carried away in that tide. So she argues that the underlying fear that attracts a person to ideology is the fear of self-contradiction. And just to add here, Arendt isn't arguing against rationalism in any way. She's talking about a kind of destructive logic that says you can't say A without saying B and C and so, don so on all the way down the murderous alphabet, as she puts it. And this kind of thinking, which always leads one to thinking the worst, is a kind of thinking that engenders skepticism and cynicism so that one can no longer trust themselves. One is taught to no longer trust their own sensual perceptions of reality. And when I say sensual perceptions, I mean the way you experience the world, physically, the way you see, the way you hear, the way you taste, smell, and so on. Instead, you have to make your experiences conform to the ideology. The other example that Arendt gives of ideological thinking, everyone's still with me? We're, I'm starting to get, okay. So the other example that she gives um, is talking about Bolshevism, uh, which demands all are agreed on the premise that history is a struggle of the classes and on the role of the party in its conduct. So Arendt understood Bolshevism actually to be a more advanced version of totalitarianism than Hitlerism. What she sees in Bolshevism and what this kind of logic means is that the party must always be right. The party must always be right. And this form of logic is expressed in the words of Trotsky, who she cites, who says, we can only be right with and by the party for hi history has provided no other way of being right. In accordance with the laws of history then, crimes will be committed against the party, which the party must then punish in order to keep within the laws of history. And in order for there to be crimes, there have to be criminals. And the party may know what the crimes are, but they may not know who the criminals are. And so it becomes more important to punish the crimes than the criminals. Yeah. And everybody is suspect and anybody can be guilty of a crime. And this is part of the totalizing nature of totalitarianism and the way she's thinking about loneliness as this radical isolation and atomization of the self where you live in a constant state of total terror where and no one is exempt. At a certain point, Hitler becomes irrelevant. Stalin becomes irrelevant. It's about the movement. Everything is about the movement. It's about the party. It's about where it's going. And the individual heads don't really matter so much because what matters is maintaining the momentum of the movement. So this kind of tyrannical ideological thinking destroys spontaneity. It is fundamentally anti-human because it negates our ability to speak, and our ability to act freely in the world. At the same time, it creates an atmosphere of absolute terror with the threat of violence. And when one submits to the tyranny of this kind of ideological thinking, they surrender their inner freedom to think. The compulsion of terror 
she describes it as the compulsion of terror that presses masses of isolated people together and supports them in a world that has become a wilderness so that every person lives in fear, not only of everybody else, but of themselves. Because the totalitarian ideology has destroyed not just people's ability to have relationships in the world with others, it destroys one's relationship with oneself. It destroys one's ability to think. And the submission to the force of this kind of ideological thinking, these kinds of logical deductions, prepares each person in his lonely isolation, she says, for tyranny. So what does that mean? It means that totalitarian movements, ideological movements, use the rhetoric and propaganda of ideology to systematically destroy people's relationships with reality so that they can no longer tell what's true and what's false, so that they can no longer trust themselves or anybody else. And then at the same time, it says, ah, we have the solution. Yes, there are all these problems and this is who we blame and this is how you can be part of the solution. So the other side, of loneliness, and I'll just finish up here because I know we're at about 40, is that is solitude. Solitude is the pleasurable state of keeping company with oneself, which is necessary for thinking. To be able to engage oneself in a conversation with oneself, to tell a story about the experiences you've had in the world, requires that you can be alone with yourself. Unlike lonely thinking and organized loneliness, where a person feels deserted by all human companionship, where a person is unable to act, to speak, to act spontaneously, to tell a story, to create meaning, to form meaningful relationships with others, the other side of this is solitude, which requires being alone. Okay. And solitude together alone with oneself and what Arendt calls the two-in-one, one is able to engage in a dialogue of thought. As people, we exist in relationship to one another. This is the fundamental condition of the human condition, plurality. We exist with one another. And confirmation of our existence depends upon our ability to appear in the world, to speak, to act, to be heard, to be seen, to be recognized in the public realm. And we have to be able to move between that space of appearances and recognition and the space of solitude and privacy where we can tell a story to ourselves about our experiences in the world, right? You have an experience, you tell yourself a story about it, you share that, that becomes part of the factual record of human existence. And that becomes the fabric of reality. And we all experience the world differently. So we all have different stories to tell, but we have to be free to tell those stories. And lonely ideological thinking doesn't care about the plurality of the human condition. It doesn't care about experience. It cares about explaining away reality. It tries to explain away the plurality of the human condition, the messiness of life, as we might think of it. For ideological thinking, there is an end. There's an end in history. There's an end in thinking. Everything is moving towards some fatalistic predetermined end. But Arendt rejects this tragic frame. And at the end of her work, she turns in a oddly hopeful note in an otherwise despairing book to Augustine to say that every end in history necessarily contains a new beginning. So just as every end contains a new beginning, there can be no end in thinking because all thinking has to move from experience in the world and thinking can only cease with the breath. Thank you so much, uh, Samantha. That was truly wonderful. Uh, wow. Um, okay, so students, do you have any questions? Um, so while 
you're formulating questions. I mean, Samantha, I, I, I wonder, I mean, Hannah Arendt having her origins in a very like, uh, I, I, I assume in a very religious atmosphere also because of the time and her background, did she explicitly uh, address religion as ideology? I muted myself. No, she doesn't. <laughs> freedom to speak and act. She doesn't really address religion systematically throughout her work. She was not a religious person. So she grew up in a pretty well-established, assimilated German Jewish family. Um, but she didn't even kind of learn she was Jewish until she experienced anti-Semitism at school. A classmate told her that she was responsible for the death of Jesus Christ. And she went home and told her mother and her mother said, when you're attacked as a Jew, you have to fight back as a Jew and taught her what anti-Semitism was. And at the time, though, like every other German school child, she was forced to attend Sunday school, uh, Christian Sunday school. Um, and at the same time, her parents insisted on sending her to synagogue on Saturdays. And after her father died, she spent some time doing a kind of private study with their rabbi, uh, but it didn't last for very long. Uh, Arendt, always rebellious, uh, formed a bit of a crush on her rabbi uh, and uh, went home one day and told her mother that she was going to marry the rabbi when she grew up. Uh, to which her mother told her, if you want to marry the rabbi, you must stop eating bacon. Uh, to which Hannah responded, then I will marry a rabbi who eats bacon. And not long after she, <laughs> She, um, she told her rabbi that uh, all prayers must be offered to, to Jesus, uh, which she had been taught by her housekeeper. But the thing is, Arendt studied theology, right? She studied theology and philosophy, but she was re reading theology as a philosopher. So when she published her first book on concepts of love and St. Augustine, which is mostly about carry toss and ways of finding a kind of political love of solidarity in the world, a way to relate to one another. Um, she was criticized um, in the book reviews for not treating Augustine as a theologian um, and not consulting the literature uh, that she read him as a philosopher on love. Um, she, is not anything. In one of my favorite panel discussions from 1972, a friend asks her, all right, what are you? Are you a Republican? Are you Democrat? Are you liberal? Are you conservative? And she says, you know, I, I don't know. I've never known. And I've never, you know, I don't think these kinds of questions will do any good. The only thing I ever was, was a Zionist. And that was from 1933 to 1944 for political reasons. And she broke with Zionism after she emigrated to the United States when Ben-Gurion Zionism took hold because she rejected the founding of Israel as a nation state. She thought the nation states as a political formation that emerged in the 19th century were in part to blame for the rise of totalitarianism. And so she does, I mean, touch on religion here and there, but she doesn't write about it in any kind of systematic way. She's thinking mostly about political ideologies when she writes about ideology. All right. Yeah. Thank you for the thorough answer. Sorry, <laughs> um, long answer. <laughs> yeah, it's, right. no, it's, it's amazing. You're a very good storyteller as well. Um, so, uh, Teresa, please. Um, hello, thank you for blowing our minds <laughs> it was brilliant um so i have kind of two questions but i think maybe i'm really interested in in uh, in her, her poetry because i didn't actually know that she she was a poet and like reading reading her work before it's it's a really kind of heavy heavy reading for especially for me as a as a non -nat non native english speaker even though my English is fluent, I, like it, it is just it's heavy. It, it's yeah. heavy with thought, and I kind of wonder how this, um, how does her poetry, um, yeah, how does it read? How does is it full of those heavy thoughts, but 
or and also interested in like if that poetry is somehow related to especially the relationship with Heidegger because he wrote his philosophy was on the other hand very kind quite poetic and and um, I mean at least the ones that I've written so I've read so yeah thank you yeah, yeah uh, wonderful question so Hannah Arendt uh, wrote 74 poems between 1923 and 1961. Uh, there's a 16 year gap in the poems we have during the interwar years. The first poems that she wrote were written for Martin Heidegger and she started writing them shortly after she went to study with him. A number of them were enclosed in her correspondence to him. If you pick up their correspondence, you'll see some of his poems to her and a couple of hers. He didn't keep her letters though. Um, the early poems are mostly written uh, imitating the style of German Romanticism. Sehen wir uns wieder, wenn Blut weiße Flieder. Ich hatte kein Kissen, du sollst nicht mehr missen. We'll see each other soon when white lilacs bloom. I'll cover you with kisses. Nothing shall miss us. Might be one rendition of that if we were to keep the rhyme scheme. It's one verse, but very playful. Um, the quality of the poems varies, but of course that also varies depending upon one's aesthetic judgment. Uh, the first poem that she writes um, after the 16 year break is for Walter Benjamin after she goes to find his grave in Port Boo, uh, which she could not find. Um, and then a lot of the later poems are written in free verse um, and reflecting on the post-war landscape. So the way that I've approached the poems is as a kind of secondary biographical text. They're markers of different travels, um, relationships. There's a poem for him and Brach. Um, and there's a poem about her husband. There's a poem about visiting France for the first time after the war, another about Germany. One of the, I think, interesting, interesting um, parts of the poems is that she's also working through certain ideas that do become part of text like the human condition. So when there's a section in the human condition when she's talking about the work of poetry and and what poems do as records of, of human existence. And she's talking about durability and the language um, overlaps very nicely with the language in a, a couple, two, three of the poems that she was working on at the same time, kind of puzzling you know, through it. So one line in German that really can't be translated is dicht für dick, das gedicht. Um, and so dick, means durability or thickness. Uh, fedict is to, to write and gedict is poem, but it's dict, fedict, das gedict. And so it's that dicks in there, that thickness that poetizes the poem that gives it its durable structure. Because for Arendt, poetry is the form, the art form that is closest to thinking. So all thinking occurs in the invisible realm of the mind and we make thoughts appear so metaphors for example come from the word metaphorine which means to bridge over literally to bridge over from the invisible realm of thinking to the world of appearances we make thinking appear but poetry is the form that's closest to the thought thinking itself um if you my the, my english translations will be out next spring but they have been translated now into Spanish and French, and there is a German edition you can get for anybody who's interested. Perfect. Thanks so much, uh, Jamal. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, and also thank you for this uh, very sharp analysis of uh, her life and, and her thinking. What I would be curious is uh, your personal opinion, because uh, the way you describe uh, ideology uh, to me seems uh, yeah very um, how do you say it? like um, really attractive to submit oneself to so that uh, <laughs> and, and, yeah exactly because on the one on the one side you say okay um, it's fundamentally anti-human 
um, but also so embedded in ourselves. So I would be curious if you, um, if you think that uh, that not all people have the uh, the mental power to resist this uh, very sexy thing called ideology. Um, do you think by by teaching ourselves um, solitude this is the only this is the the best solution uh, we have against uh, this big monster of ideology do you, you get what I, Did you hear that nelly are, are you there the monster of ideology i hear another movie um okay i think so there's <laughs> two things in there that i want to break apart um one is the question of solitude and the power of solitude and the other is the fundamentally anti-human nature of ideology so there's two different things going on here and i just want to kind of clarify um every political thinker has a different account of kind of the, the essence of what makes us human right so for karl marx it's that we have the ability to apply our hands to raw material and transform it into a thing right we have labor power right everybody has right this is our what we have for hobbes life is nasty brutish and short every man has a natural right to everything to take what he wants when he will for rousseau we are naturally uh we naturally have what he calls pity or what we might think of as empathy when we see other sentient creatures suffering uh we look at them we realize that we are alive like they are and they're not looking so good so that doesn't look good and i don't want that to happen to me so this is not desirable um and we have a desire for self-preservation right so if we see somebody coming at us we're going to jump in the bushes uh, because we want to protect our life for hannah arendt stealing a bit from aristotle what we have is our plurality we are all equal only in the sense that we are unequal every human being is distinct no one who was is or will be will ever be the same and we inhabit the earth together earth is our home and we build the world in common we make the world poesis we make the world in common but we no man is an island right we exist together we appear in the world with others and that's plurality the difference and the plurality of the human condition what ideology that's fundamentally human what ideology does is it tries to negate that difference it tries to flatten to bulldoze over everything to make everyone equal to make everything to the same and to take the beautiful plural nature of human existence the messiness of it the experiences all of the sensual perceptions of reality and to force them into this tight little frame to say we have the historical right. This is the tide of history. This is how things are going to go. And everything has to fit within this ideological stream. And if it doesn't, it has to be cut off. Hence my pro Christian frame is very much what it is. It chops off anything that doesn't fit into it. And so it's fundamentally anti-human. And the other side of that is it's anti-human because it's, it stops us in our thinking and appearing. It takes away our ability to appear freely, to act and to speak. Because everything we say, everything we do has to conform to the ideology. Okay. And so is it appealing? Yeah, right? I mean, so for our end, I mean, what the underlying fear that she notes here is that it's a fear of self-contradiction. Ideology offers people a simplified way of life where they can stick to a very narrow lane. That phrase has taken on a lot of meaning this day, but I just meant it in the, in the tide sense. So you could use it in that sense too. And it's a question of political 
economic, and social suffering. Wherever there are complex human problems that go along with living together, where there's social inequality, economic suffering, men who are willing to chase after nothing but power for the sake of acquiring more power, wherever there's social, economic, and political strife, there are going to be ideologies that appeal to people. I mean, if you think about Donald Trump descending the escalator and announcing his candidacy for presidency by saying, you know, there's economic suffering in America. True, there is, right? And he says, it's because of the immigrants. It's because of, right, here's the people you blame. Here are the scapegoats. Here's the other, right? This is how we fix it. Here's the ideology. America first. Make America great again, right? And that is a kind of populism, which is adjacent to totalitarianism. But wherever these problems exist, there's going to be ideology. Um, I think that solitude is incredibly powerful. Teaching people how to be alone with themselves is incredibly powerful. But I think at the end of the day, the question comes to, you know, what can be taught? And I don't have a good answer for that. I don't have a, I don't think anyone can answer that. Um, it's, a, it's more of a hope than it is um, a positive claim, which is part of what makes it less appealing than an ideology, the idea that we can teach thinking. Okay, um, thanks so much. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. we've run out of time and there are many, many questions still in the chat. So what would be the best way to, uh, to get in touch with you, Sam? Um, you uh, have my email. Um, I don't know how many questions there are, yeah. or if you have to move on. If there's like a couple more minutes, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, we can. We can. Yeah, if if if, if most of you can stay, yes, we can go to maybe one more question. Sure. Um, okay, I I will have to curate here because there are too many questions. But um, okay. Oh my god. I feel so unfair, but this is a provocative one. Uh, Francisco. I don't see the questions. Only okay. Here, so I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, Francisco, are you here? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, but there's, a, I mean, I kind of hoarded the questions uh, time uh, yesterday. So I was just trying to keep uh, my, my own questions uh, for the last. So I guess that you, you have uh, other people that would be. Or I mean, I can still do it. But. What's your question, Francisco? Well, no, that, that I think that it, that it's a little bit tautological, uh, aren't uh, position because yes, it, isn't her ideas also ideological? And no, also they're radically not. And I think that's you know, it's one of the it's one of my favorite things about Hannah Arendt's work is that it's radically open. You know, in one of in one of her essays on Heidegger at 80, she says, you know, if only we could all be so lucky enough to rethink everything we've thought and totally change our minds. And Arendt's constantly, you know, changing her mind. Her work is riddled with, I think, really provocative contradictions, which we could jump into. But part of her understanding is that there is no end in thinking. And it's the antithesis of ideology in that sense, because it's about constantly being in the only tense that matters, which is the present tense of now, of responding to what it is that is happening in the world around us. It's thinking about thinking as a constantly active, engaged process, which everybody is going to experience differently because we all have different sensual experiences of the world. But the thing is that, you know, so we're all in this class right now. We all have a different experience of it. We could have a beer later or tea or, and everybody could, you know, say like what they liked, what they didn't like, what they got, what they wanted, you know, we would all have something different, but sharing that together is what creates the fabric of reality as opposed to an ideology, which would just explain it away or say it is. And so it's about breaking through that and opening 
the ways in which we think about the world.